Thank you, Chairman, Senators, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to welcome you this evening <clears throat> and to launch in Queensland this important collection of essays on a very interesting subject. This Banco Court has witnessed a great variety of general community events, um, especially, if I may say, over the last decade or so, including a number of book launches. Most recently, the Governor-General's launch on the 19th of June of Dr Denver Beanland's History of the District Court of Queensland, and penultimately in March this year, the Attorney-General's launch of the History of the Queensland Council of Civil Liberties. Four months on, the focus of the occasion is, may I say, cognate. I was also pleased to be asked to contribute to the book. In the year 2005, the Australian Lawyers' Alliance asked me to deliver a keynote address at their annual conference that year in Cairns. The association had only recently broadened its charter from plaintiff litigation to a wider attention to human rights. I was asked to speak at the conference on an Australian Bill of Rights. I had by then formed a personal view that a statutory Bill of Rights was undesirable, but I hadn't yet been prepared to enter into any public debate by declaring my position. And so I delivered at the conference a paper which canvassed the arguments for and the arguments against, and then I left the decision to the jury. I recall the indignant dismay of one journalist I had thereby denied a story. By the time Julian approached me last year, my reticence had evaporated. I readily agreed that the public debate on the issue had become quite one-sided and the notion of a coordinated expression of the alternative view attracted me. Julian may have been surprised by the speed with which I provided my contribution. It was largely accomplished by resurrecting my Cairns paper and cutting it in two. But, but con contrary to Fred Daly's oft-repeated retort to Jim Killen, it did matter which half I published. The oddity of this debate is that it should be happening at all. I sense no particular drive from the citizenry agitating for a statutory Bill of Rights, let alone one constitutionally enshrined. While the parliaments of Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory have chosen to speak for their people on the issue, any national agitation, so far as I discern it, is led by, and probably confined to, a group of academic lawyers. That the Brennan inquiry has received a lot of submissions is, of course, another matter. My feeling is that the people of Australia are satisfied with the level of identification and protection of rights presently prevailing. Yet the campaign of the proponents reached a point where contrary arguments needed presentation, and I congratulate the Menzies Research Centre and the editors, Julian Lesser and Lisa and Ryan Hadrick, on having assembled a varied selection of compelling essays from prominent and interesting contrib contributors. Of course, one of the risks attending expressed opposition to a Bill of Rights is that one be condemned as antagonistic to human rights generally. That non sequitur is a risk to be run. My own view is that so far as they should specific, specifically be identified, our rights as Australian citizens are well established and well protected by an array of legislative pronouncements. I likewise was struck by what Sir Robert Menzies said in 1966, and uh, Senator Brandis reminded, of that, uh, uh, reminded us of that in his contribution. My particular professional concern as a judicial officer rests in the consequences for the Australian judiciary and public perceptions of it. And I've said something of this in my own contribution. Ian Callanan, in his paper, reminds us of a telling observation by the present Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, in 1997, when the Canadian Charter had been up and running for 15 years. She said that the Canadian Charter had thrust the Supreme Court of Canada into an uncertain sea of value judgments. The gavel on the cover of the book 
is being wielded by an exceptionally, exceptionally youthful looking hand. <laughs> Maybe it belongs to a young American judge of the elected ilk. May we never follow that expedient here. But significantly, I think, the hammer appears not to have made contact. The resolution is unclear. Judges should not decide these issues. With well-established exceptions, the most notable being the application and incremental development of the common law, the Australian judicial role, as well understood by the public, is to deliver justice according to law, that is, the law ordained by the people's elected representatives in the parliament. It is for parliaments, not judges, to prescribe relevant limitations on such issues as, and I deliberately select two which are graphically contentious, abortion and privacy. Yet, it is said, we are internationally out of step. We should follow the lead of nations which have adopted bills of rights. Well, let us not overlook that those nations include, or have included, chillingly, Zimbabwe, North Korea, Iran, Nazi Germany and Fiji. On the other hand, as the former Prime Minister of Australia suggests in this volume, our country is one of fewer than 10 nations to have remained continuously democratic for the last 100 years. We judges regularly admonish juries to draw only inferences which are reasonably open. I suggest the inference in this case is clear, and that is substantial public satisfaction with the persisting level of the identification and protect protection of basic rights in this country. Following supposed leaders is not necessarily the best way forward. <clears throat> Some years ago, Australian judges were urged to adopt a set of ethical guidelines which had attracted a number of respected international adherents. Those guidelines included a provision telling judges they must not accept bribes. You may be reassured that we Australians declined to adopt those guidelines, lest it be thought Australian judges were either inclined to accept bribes or alternatively needed to be reminded against doing so. Experiences are not uniform and a need in one jurisdiction may not exist in another. Ladies and gentlemen, we confront, through this book, a monumentally significant issue. I say in conclusion that I agree with the editors when they submit that, quote, such is the effect that a Bill of Rights would have on our institutions that no Bill of Rights should be introduced without a vote of the Australian people. It is with great pleasure now that I launch in this state, don't leave us with the bill, the case against an Australian Bill of Rights, and in doing so, I thank and congratulate the Institute, the editors, and the other contributors. Thank you.